Hello, everyone. Uh, it's uh, 1 p.m., so let's start. This is a DHC working group meeting. So if you are here for something else, you are in the wrong room. So uh, let's start. So the first uh, item on this is note well. You should probably seen this too many times. Okay, so um, as Tomek mentioned, Tom, that's Tomek, and I'm Bernie, your uh, working group co-chairs, and we also have Shang, our uh, working group secretary here. And um, as Tomek mentioned, you should have seen the note well. The blue sheets are going around. Please uh, fill in that. Uh, we need uh, Jabber and Etherpad uh, scribes. So if somebody is willing to do that. That would be, you know, either or both. Uh, Sheng is going to be doing some of the Ethernet pads, Etherpad stuff. But um, if anybody else can help out, that would, would be much appreciated. Is anybody willing to, to declare that they will help out? Okay, great. Thanks, Suresh. Okay, yeah, do the, the minutes. Okay. So if anybody else is on the Etherpad and can put some notes in there, that would be great. Okay, so quick rundown on the agenda. We're doing the first thing, and I've got a few more slides on that. Um, then we'll talk about the privacy considerations and the uh, anonymity profiles. I'll, I'll probably mispronounce that forever. It's one of those tough words for me. Uh, Yang models for both DHCP v6 and DHCP4. And we'll also have a presentation on secure DHCP v4. And then the remaining time will uh, be used to uh, discuss some of the DHCP v6 biz items. Anybody have anything that, you know, either a conflict that we need to move things around or anything like that or any other agenda bashing? Okay. So an update for the working group since the last ITF, and this technically is out of date, but that's just because it, it happened earlier this week. We do have one um, RC in the editor queue right now, which is the stateful issues draft. Um, we do have some sitting in publication uh, requested. The uh, active lease query for V6 was uh, returned by Ted, has been updated, but we need to uh, finish getting it back to the AD, which our, our new AD is going to be uh, Terry. And, and by the way, uh, sorry, Brian. I, I, I see Terry sitting here, I don't see Brian, so that's why. <laughs> So you'll be sitting in for him. Yeah, and, and by the way, I, I, I should okay. I, I should have mentioned that we want to thank Ted, um, Ted Lemon, for his AD ship for the past uh, two years, was it? And, uh, you know, thank you for all the, the stuff you've done there. It was great working with you. And, um, you know, we'll have to work with uh, Brian and stuff to find out exactly. I'm not sure exactly what the, the changeover in AD will do to some of these documents and stuff, but, you know, we, we just have to get them back in to the queue and find out. Ted, are you you're sort of just handing everything over to him? There's nothing more that, that you're going to be doing. Okay. Yep, you're done. Um, so the secure DHCP... The sixth draft was also returned by Ted. I think we're now done with the issues there and uh, should be ready to go back. Okay. Right, and then we may have one final tweak or whatever. So if, if people do... Uh, I think right now it's what, the 07 version, I think it is even, or something, right? 06, okay. But, um, you know, do go in. What's that? 
Yeah, 07, yeah. So do go take a look at that because, you know, if you can, if you had any concerns about some of the discussions happened, because we do want to get that document moved forward. Um, we also have the dynamic shared before allocation and the access network identifier drafts that are sitting with the uh, AD, although they have not. Um, I'll, I'll have to follow up with Brian um, shortly to find out exactly what's going to happen with those and what we need to do. There's um, one document that's the active lease query uh, before that's just awaiting finalization of the Shepherd write-up, uh, which I think Tomek you have. Yep. And um, then we had uh, three documents that were adopted and uh, one that passed working group last call and is with the IESG. That's the access network identifier or, you know, is with the AD, I should say. Some of the other working group documents um, and I, I, you know, we may want to discuss these very briefly is that um, the address registration uh, draft kind of <coughs> failed working group last call. Um, and so the question is, what is the next step for that? Do we want to do any more with that? Um, is there need interest for it? So Rush is shaking his head no. Okay, so we'll, we'll consider that a dead document at this point and, you know, we can always, always resurrect it if we, we need to. Okay. And um, the DHCP stable privacy addresses. It's not on the agenda. Is there um, anybody have anything to say about that document? Okay, well, I'll have to follow up with the authors on that. Um, Toboconf, uh, there's one more revision needed, um, and then it should hopefully be ready to, to move on. Um, that, and that was from the uh, working group last call. There were some, some comments that were missed. And Kim has been working on the failover documents. Yep, say something. So the failover protocol is on the GitHub. There's a GitHub site which I sent me off the working group on for the V6 failover uh, protocol piece. I did a bunch of work on that. It's not really good enough to submit as a ICF draft at this stage. There's still more work that needs to be done on it, but the structure is clear. If anybody had a chance to look at it, I'll be glad to hang around after the meeting and chat with somebody. If anybody's interested, I'll be here. Uh, that's, I did manage to put some significant time to that in the last uh, three or four weeks. I haven't done much with the design. Uh, there are some, I, there, yeah, I haven't done much with the design. I think the, my plan right now is to try to get the protocol document solid and then go back and clean up the design uh, as necessary based on the protocol. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Kim. Um, we have a bunch of uh, related documents, and um, you know, I, I more want to just point these out unless somebody has some question uh, about any of them or wants to discuss it very briefly to figure out what the next steps are. Or we you know because I mean the next step would be to consider working group adoption, um, but hopefully people have been looking at these. Um, some of them are on the agenda, and I flagged those, so we, we should wait on discussing any of those. Anybody have anything to say about any of the documents on this slide? Okay, I'll go on to the next one. There's five more, two of which are on the agenda. I think the... Uh, the um, Oh, no, it's not on this one. It's the next slide. It's the next slide. So there's one more slide. Anybody have anything to say on any of these documents? Okay. Um, yeah, so that that's it. There's three more there. So the, the secure access mechanism was on the agenda, but we the authors had requested us to uh, wait until Prague as they had an update they wanted to do before discussing it further, but, you know, people have comments and things, you should get them yep, to the office. Yeah, uh, so basically, I think uh, when we are here talking to the, uh, talking to uh, the, uh, some of the experts here, there are some mechanisms we need to clarify it. So in, we are going to update in the next version, and then we post it on the mailing list, and then we can have the discussion instead. Okay. Okay, thanks. Great. 
So uh, one item that uh, we need to do, Tomek and I have done a little bit of cleanup on the milestones, but we need to, to clean them up. So uh, anybody that has a working group document, um, you know, that's an author, we will get in touch with you shortly after this IETF and, and basically we want to sort of have at least the two <coughs> milestones of the working group last call target and, you know, usually a month or two later hopefully to submit to the IESG um, and so we'll follow up with you. And for some of the people that, you know, are, are looking at adoption of, of work, we'd like to also put that in as a target milestone. So again, those, that list of about 13 documents, some of those will we'll want to follow up with you as well. Um, one other thing, there was an announcement uh, yesterday that there will be a hackathon event at that ITF 93 in Prague. And so one of the questions is, um, do we want to do anything uh, possibly at uh, the, the hackathon event? Um, you know, it's the, the Saturday and Sunday before the IETF, right immediately before the IETF. Some things we might want to think about is, you know, are there things with a secure DHCP v6 draft that people might want to experiment with or, or even the, the upcoming v4 one. There might be um, other things on staple issues or the shared v4 allocation or even some of the privacy things that we might want to think about. So just think about it and if there's, there's interest in doing something, let's see if we can get something put on the uh, hackathon agenda. You know, we will need a lead, somebody that's willing to, to sort of, you know, define what, what the goals and, you know, what, what will actually happen at the, the hackathon will be. Anybody have any comments one way or the other as to whether they want to? No? Okay. All right. <coughs> Okay, so just a minor update to the presentation. There's also one slide, uh, there's one draft that was not mentioned. That's uh, uh, DHCPv6 load balancing. It's expired. We'll see whether its author is willing to continue work on it or what will be the next steps. Okay, so let's move to the first uh, agenda item. That's the, the one thing is, and probably I should have stood over there when oh. I did the slides, but they do want you to stand in the pink box so that you'll be on the, okay, on the meet you. <laughs> okay, so uh, th this is the uh, updates regarding uh, DHCP privacy considerations. So there's uh, quite a lot uh, going on. So this is a general overview and update. There are many people involved. Uh, I was the designated speaker this time. So, okay, next slide. Uh, there were two uh, drafts that were about anal analysis of the uh, DHCPv4 and DHCPv6 privacy. They were uh, adopted. So the uh, individual submissions uh, by mistake, they will uh, uh, standard struck. So th that was corrected, it's now informational. Uh, so uh, please review them and uh, comment on them. So, and the question to the working group is, uh, what should be the next steps? Uh, is there anything else uh, you want to be covered in those drafts? Uh, so if so, please, uh, please uh, say so. And my question to the working group is, uh, do, you f uh, do you think that uh, we should wait with those drafts uh, uh, for the uh, mitigation uh, solutions and then try to uh, push them forward uh, together as a group or do you want to move forward with the analysis first? Any comments? Marcin Szulerski, IRC. I, I would, I would personally, I would wait for the mitigation jobs to be to become more mature, because there may, may be always something that is a result of the discussion about the mitigation jobs that should be placed in those jobs. So personally, I think we we should maybe wait a little bit, right? And then the other comment that I wanted to make is perhaps we should rename those jobs our 
the privacy for DHCP v6 or v4 clients because otherwise it seems like it's the client and the server and the relay and the jobs actually explicitly say that it's only the privacy of the clients that is considered. So. Yeah, first uh, I agree we should wait for a while um, because, you know, we need to understand more, you know, what the solution may be, then we need to come back you know, to re revisit the, you know, analysis draft. Um, but um, I don't think, you know, we have to wait that long, you know, to till the uh, mitigation draft, uh, you know, to publish together, but uh, it, you know, maybe worse for another uh, round of IETF meeting or maybe two, uh, but, um, you know, they are not necessary to be grouped together with the migration draft. Okay. So that will definitely work for me. Uh, in my opinion, grouping them would be a bit tricky because uh, the number of uh, drafts in the solution and mitigation area could uh, keep growing, so so it would be a bit fuzzy. What should we group? Okay. So next slide, please. Uh, currently, there are uh, three drafts uh, that uh, can be considered uh, mitigation drafts. So the first one is uh, draft Huitema DHC anonymity profile. Uh, so the on a very high level, the assumption is that uh, client does not uh, trust the network, uh, including the server, and uh, tries to limit disclosure on, on any information. So this is the typical case when you visit a network, like on the airport, Wi-Fi hotspot, or... Uh, uh, so and this draft uh, uh, will be covered in a separate presentation. So another draft is uh, you, uh, DHC, DHCPv6, SA, that's secure access. So it tries to solve a slightly different problem. Uh, this draft uh, assumes that uh, the server can be trusted and it attempts to establish a, a, a security rela relationship with the server and then build on this. Uh, what the, there was planned uh, presentation for this, but it was canceled, it will be uh, delivered in Prague. And the last one is uh, uh, draft uh, Mogalski DHCP6 privacy mitigation. So at this stage, this is a collection of mitigation ideas. Uh, it, it was planned to, uh, to evolve into a solution, but, Bernie, Bernie next slide, please. Uh, but uh, we had a discussion with uh, Christian, and uh, we talked that there's a huge overlap be, uh, between what Christian proposed and uh, what we had, so we decided that it would be best to, uh, to combine those drafts. So since the Christian's draft is more mature at this stage, uh, we decided that uh, we'll pick the parts of the text uh, that are not uh, already covered from uh, the privacy mitigation and we'll just merge it. So uh, there's, uh, I think, seven or eight uh, ideas discussed in the, uh, in the uh, privacy mitigation. So, th so the first one is that uh, the client should not disclose the desire for privacy, uh, because in many cases, <coughs> when the client ex expresses this desire, if the operator is willing to cooperate, that's fine. But if he's unwilling or is forced to uh, enable additional uh, surveillance and anti-privacy methods. Uh, that's just that would just make uh, the work for him uh, easier. Fortunately, this is uh, already covered by the anonymity profile draft, so there's no action needed for this. Next, please. Okay, so the next uh, concept uh, or mitigation uh, mechanism is to randomize the do it. So I won't go into the details. It's already covered in uh, anonymity profile, so. We can skip this. Bernie, next, please. Okay, so another mitigation technique is uh, don't send confirm. Everything there's uh, uh, the link uh, flaps or there's uh, 
the client connects uh, to, to a new link, uh, it is supposed to send confirm, and in this confirm it sends its uh, addresses. And by doing this, it uh, reveals its previous locations. So this is obviously a, a privacy issue. So the recommendation is that the client should not send uh, confirm. So this was not covered by anonymity profile, so we will <coughs> add the text. Next. Uh, another concept is uh, whether the client should use temporary addresses. So by, by using temporary addresses, the client uh, uh, suggests that uh, he might be willing to change his addresses frequently and uh, that, mi that might indicate that he's willing to, uh, that he's willing to uh, keep his uh, privacy. So there's an alternative proposal. So instead of using IETA, uh, the client, uh, instead of uh, using temporary addresses, he could uh, send uh, IANA uh, with randomized AIID. So if he wants to get a new address, he sends a request with a uh, new IANA with a different uh, AIID address. <coughs> so that would uh, enforce the address change uh, in a similar way how the IETA or originally worked. Well, Christian Uitema. Uh, yeah, I, I see what you, the intent there, but it may well be backfiring because the clients that are not hiding their identity will send, will also require temporary addresses. And they will require them so that they can have outgoing connection to servers. So if the general behavior of everybody is to require temporary addresses, you might just as well. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you are distinguished in this way. OK, I see your point. So but in practice, uh, temporary addresses are not that frequently used nowadays. So. Um, so Rish Krishnan, uh, like another problem with the temporary address is that there's no renewal semantics like specified for that, right? So if you want to continue using IATA, we need to figure out like how to do the renewals for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I suppose there's no clear uh, consensus here that whether we should do this uh, or not, so we'll just keep discussing this on the mailing list, but probably this will not fly. Okay, next. So the next one is a suggestion that is also covered by the anonymity profile, is to avoid sending FQDN because uh, when uh, the client sends FQDN, uh, it can reveal its hostname or uh, that that is another type of identifier that can be used to track the, uh, the device. And in cases if the FQDN is really needed for whatever reason, uh, the best way is to use a randomized hostname. And the anonymity profile is uh, recommending that this should be a, a hex version of the uh, link layer address. So, okay, next. Just, just a quick, uh, Martin Fedorsky, I see. I, I mean, I, I agree with randomizing the host name. The, the thing that I suggested to Christian when reviewing his draft was that every implementation should follow the same algorithm for randomizing your host name because otherwise, if you don't specify that, everybody can do that differently, right? And that way you can sort of fingerprint the client operating system or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. so. Okay, that's a good point. Okay, so uh, another aspect that was not covered by anonymity profile is that <coughs> you can fingerprint the device, so to extract the OS the, and OS version or uh, the specific software that is running on by investigating what's the order of options uh, in the message itself and also order of the option codes in option request option. So it would be good to randomize those. There's, there should be no impact or anything, the server, the option order should not matter. Okay, next. Uh, another thing that is not covered is the uh, anonymous information request. 
uh, if the client uh, wants to use uh, stateless mode to get only the options, uh, this is not frequently used, but it's uh, definitely allowed by the spec to not send the client ID. So if it's not mandatory, then don't send it. Okay, next. Uh, okay, so there's there was also a <sighs> dummy section in the uh, privacy mitigation about server privacy. Uh, we think that it wouldn't be useful to put this into the <coughs> anonymity profile. The anonymity profile is focusing on clients. So if there will be a will to uh, work on the server privacy mitigation, this will probably be a separate draft. Okay, next. So right now we are uh, working on, on the merge. Uh, probably the updated uh, version will be published in the next couple of days. Okay. Okay, that's it. So I suppose uh, sometime after the updated version is uh, published, we will ask for adoption. So expect the uh, adoption call maybe in a month, maybe in three weeks. The anonymity profile. Uh, okay, so I've sent updated version to Suresh for double checking. So Suresh, do you think it's okay, or do you have any other things to? I would, I would like to do some minor edits, maybe like in the next three, four days. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So in that case, we could publish updated version in uh, in four days, so we can start adoption call next week. Okay. A, one question, do we want to have any sort of guidelines for, you know, there may be new options developed down the road and what they might do, or is that, do we just think that that may not be worth it? You know, just so that, I mean, obviously, you know, some of the guidelines maybe if you're going to put an identifier in, base it on the MAC address or something like that, you know. And I, I don't recall whether there was any sort of general guidance about that in either document offhand, but maybe there's something that we want to think about just making a general comment for future options. Okay, so do you think about something like uh, the options guideline draft just for <laughs> privacy? Well, just, just a, I think it's just a minor section, maybe a quick section, you know. Okay, sure. We can do that. I don't know. May not, you know, it may, 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 it may be better, e it may be complicated to do, but. No, but we, we, we can definitely have a section about the uh, future evolution or something like yeah. that and say, hey, we are perfectly conscious that people will keep on uh, creating new DHCP options and so, which, because we don't know about them yet, cannot be in that profile today. And the general guideline is that uh, if those options have an identity, uh, are disclosing identity, then when you implement them, uh, in the future, well, be careful. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Thanks. Okay, next is Christian. Okay, good afternoon. I'm Christian Wittemar. Uh, Tomek already covered a lot of this material, but uh, Basically, I, I prepared this draft to cover one very specific scenario, and uh, if you want to go to the next slide. How many of you have seen that picture before? So it's an advertisement for uh, something that was done by uh, a company in England that had equipped uh, trash cans in the street with a Wi-Fi scanner. And, and they, they were basically scanning uh, the, uh, the web to find the uh, unique IDs of uh, your cell phone when your cell phone is looking for a new customer in the store and tracking it. And they are not the only one. People are doing that in, uh, in malls. People are doing that uh, in uh, airports, or <coughs> railway station, what I was talking about in the freeway. Uh, I'm getting and so, 
So th there is also a surveillance component in that, right? Uh, one of the big issues is that, is that if you can associate a MAC address <laughs> with an identity, <laughs> then uh, you, you can build a database. So I was discussing that with colleagues and I said, hey, you know what? We can do one of two things. Either we can fix the problem, or we should be in the business of building the database and selling it to everybody. Right? So we don't want to be that business. We're going to fix the problem. The way it is fixed is wow. Yeah, it's here. I, I think no. The problem is that I'm going to just have to go out of full screen mode for this. I think. Hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, no, I did not get a mirror display. Hold on. So, but I, I can use it. The way, the way it's being done, if you have oh, seen the, the, the MAC address randomization experiment that's going on in the IETF right now, work going on in the IEEE <coughs> to basically make sure that we, we can do that. Yeah. The problem there is that there is a very close relation between MAC addresses and DHCP. What is being observed already today in the uh, experiment is that people change their MAC address and they get the same decision. And if you change your MAC address and get the same IP, then it's uh, very easy to say, oh, same guy, and I can track you. And the reason for that is that uh, the, the MAC address is uh, basically for us. So how do people change the MAC address? We can, we can think of many ways, there are many strategies. The first thing that will come to mind to anyone is to have a timer and say, oh, every 20 minutes I'm going to change my MAC address. Uh, it turns out that doesn't work very well because when you change your MAC address, say you are in a hotel room, the hotel will pop up a new uh, web page and ask you to pay again for the Wi-Fi connection. So you don't really want to do that. You want to change your MAC address uh, just when you configure a new network or, or maybe you want to keep the same MAC address when you come back to the same network and things like that. But basically the assumption that we are making in this uh, consideration is that you will change your MAC address just before you make your DHCP connection. <coughs> You will have connected to the network, and then the first thing you do is your DHCP connection. And uh, yes, no, no. So, so that's basically people are going to adopt one of those two variants in practice, because the other ones are. Yeah. So, oh, I see. Now. What we are saying is that what, what we do observe is that people get change their MAC address and they get the same IP address. And the reason for that yeah, is okay. the DHCP identifier. I mean, if you keep the same do it in the MAC address, in the DHCP request, then the DHCP server is specifically designed to give you the same IP address. So we have the correlation is cycle there. That uh, if you don't change those three variables at the same time, then you don't get randomization. You don't get. So if you have the same do it, you get the same address even if you use If you have the same map and a different IP, well, people can track it very easily. Similarly, if you have a different map and the same IP, you will still be tracked because people can find it in an entire system and they can find that. So that's basically the crux of the, the randomization profile. Basically make sure that we change all that. Does this only happen with stateful DHCP? Yes. Okay, so you, you can avoid this by not doing stateful, right? Only stateless? In, uh, in IPv6? Yeah, you can just do stateless DHCP, right? Yes, but in IPv4 you cannot. Oh, yeah. 
That was Lorenzo, by the way. <laughs> this is Ted Lemon. Um, so uh, this, the, uh, the tracking that you're trying to prevent is just tracking of the IP address? Basically, the, the theory of tracking is that the trackers use whatever the information they have to put you in some kind of a profiling bucket. Mm -hmm. So whatever information they have access to, they will use. Mm -hmm. And if they have already a lot of knowledge about you, they need very little additional information to say, oh, it's the same bucket. Right. Kind of thing. So if they know already which IP address you had, and they suddenly see the same IP address with a different MAC address, they say, oh, OK, don't fool me. I know we'll see the same guy. So that would be a yes? Yes. <laughs> OK. <laughs> the reason I ask is because if your concern is about um, uh, uh, and this isn't necessarily something you'd have to do, but if you just vary the IAID, you don't have to vary the DUID. Um, and of course, if you're concerned about the security, if you're concerned about your privacy on the local network, yes. then um, you do have to verify, vary, vary the DUID because we, otherwise we, it's we, trackable. We do, we do observe surveillance systems that are being backed into airport networks and right, systems. Right, right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. 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 I guess what I was getting at there is you actually do care about something more than the IP address. Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, yes. Okay. So that's basically the anonymity profile draft. I mean, Tomek went through into a lot of details of the various uh, elements there, but I'm, I'm going to just stay at the level of the philosophy. What are we trying to achieve there? Well, in the draft, I'm covering both uh, DHCPv4 and DHCPv6 because there is a lot of motivation text, etc. that's very much the same, and we, we are solving the same problem at the same time in the two environments. So I, I think it's easier to treat them at the same time. And I, we had discussion about that. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but like relaying a question from Jabber. Yes. Will there be a separate document to define how the MAC address will be changed randomly? It's from uh, Lin Hui Sun. Uh, I, I have. Uh, the problem is that the MAC address is not an ITF standard. So if we do a document uh, explaining how to do that, it will be in the IEEE. Now, there is, there is a group in the IEEE, there's work in progress in the IEEE 802 group. There is a some kind of preliminary work that's going on there to, to define how to do that. Otherwise, I mean, you have a private implementation, like a, <coughs> a Apple did some implementation, and I assume that other operating system will do other implementation as well. So we, we shall see that. So basically, both uh, the HP4 and the HPV6, and the idea is to look at the Okay. Yeah, um, actually, that's back to uh, last question. Um, Who are you? Oh, Xing. Yeah. Um, I, I fully agree that's not the IETF work, yeah. um, but uh, that's uh, very important in the draft to you know r give the you know reference you know where that MAC address randomly will happen and what maybe when it will happen because. As you said, if we only change you know, DHCP and the max address still remain you know, stable, that doesn't make any sense. That, that is true. And uh, look, my problem there is that I could document how I would implement it if I implemented it. Yeah. OK. But that will be my document, or just that for the moment. OK. OK. And, uh, I have searched on the web with uh, Apple as a document about how they implemented it, but it's, I, don't, I did not fit, find it. So. Yeah. Uh, Mohamed there from Silicon. Uh, I have just one naive question about yeah, th th this work. Who is the bad guy in this, in this, in this scenario? They are, the bad guys are typically the guys tracking track of you in the, uh, in the malls in the airports, I mean, there are commercial systems that do that today, that keep track. Uh, there are surveillance systems, various police states do that, mm -hmm. to uh, uh, make surveillance of who is going to the railroad station or the airport and using their MAC addresses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So these yeah, guys are the bad yeah, guys. Yeah, in fact, I'm, I'm not talking about the, the, MAC, the specific point about the MAC addresses, because yes, I agree with you that if there is a unique and stable identifier, you, you can always co correlate between yeah. and so on. But back to the DHCP uh, question itself, if I, I, I want just to make sure that if, if you, we, if, do you think that the network provider, are you doing this kind of work so that the network provider ha, um, has, because the network provider has other means to identify, to identify the lines and so on. So I think that we, we have to specify very, very well the, the use case that we are covering here to, um, and why this work is needed. Yeah. Um, because at the end of the day, if we are making things more harder for the network provider and for the application and content providers, they have other means to identify you. So you, if you are making harder for at, at, at the network net, network layer, and then you are like for the co cookies for to, to identify the, cast, uh, the the user, or for instance, if you go to Panoclix web, website, you can see that just for your browser configuration, you are you are unique, and you don't need even to go to uh, to to, the, to at, the, at the IP address to, to identify a user. So I want to just to uh, to uh, to agree and to. Uh, to see what is the, the, the use case that we are trying to, to, uh, to address here. Is it the, the network sp provider specific case or um, for some deployment context that, that are mainly for the Wi-Fi uh, and this kind it's of... It's mostly Wi-Fi. It well, the, 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 the work uh, there is mostly Wi-Fi and mostly going to random hotspots that you don't know really who's providing them and what they're doing. Yeah, so be because you, you don't have a, con a, contro a control leg between the device and the, p the first con um, uh, network attachment point. Yes. Okay, so is, is it possible to have a document or at least in, in this kind of documents we have this use case to say that we are addressing exactly this, this, this scope? Is it something which is... Which is, which is, uh, which so, is so there are, there are two points in your, in your remark. I mean, you're asking me specifically what do we have in mind right now? Mm -hmm. And what we have in mind right now is people connect to all kinds of random Wi-Fi networks, some of which are tracking them. So that, that's, that's what we have in mind right now. Mm -hmm. You're making another consideration is that, hey, even if I don't track you with your MAC address, I can track you some other way. And until we have uh, plugged all the other ways, Hiding the MAC address is futile. And uh, we have had those kind of discussion in the security working group for a long time. And the, the answer is no. Yes, there is a big fire burning at many places. But that doesn't mean that you shall not stop the fire in your own place first. And then we'll stop it there, and we'll stop it there, and eventually it will stop. I agree with the logic. I want just to make sure that for the use case should be uh, captured somewhere so that uh, people understand what we, you are trying to, uh, to, to address. Okay. Th thank you. So basically what the profile does is provide safe options so that uh, basically if you are using, if you are composing the HTTP messages using the safe option, you will not be identified. The other point that is notable is that we try to also prevent platform fingerprinting. That basically, if you have different device implementing a profile like that in different way, then we get another kind of fingerprinting similar to the, the browser fingerprinting that was uh, alluded to. That if some, say, if uh, Linux of a certain version uses these three particular options and Windows use those four options and uh, I don't know, I mean, iOS use another four, then this combination can be used to identify the platform. And identify the platform is one of those little tokens that you add together to identify the user. So we are trying to achieve that as well, give a common profile to everybody. Excellent. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so uh, I would like that to be a, work, a working group item. I think Tomek made the, the same point just before. And the idea that we want to do is basically merge a few drafts, incorporate feedback that we have from a number of reviewers, get more review, and then. <coughs> yeah, Kim Kinnear, Cisco. I had a three
comments one of, about, your, about the draft. One of them was you've got must and should here kind of intermixed, and it wasn't clear to me that was intentional. Sometimes you said you should do this, and sometimes you said you must do this. Yes. So I was thinking you might want to pick one, probably must. If you're following this, this draft, this potential RFC, then you must do it this way. Yeah. Unless, okay. you know, there's a, I, I find myself saying should a lot in the drafts I write, but it's probably more to be, people beat on me about that, so I thought I'd offer you, that you, to you. You're right. <laughs> uh, we should be more tight there. And uh, the typical says that we should say must, unless there are really two ways, in which case you should, we should say should and may. Yeah. Yes. I'm good with that. In section 4.5, you said, well, I don't know if it's must or should do it this way, unless it's in a trusted environment. I think that's a mistake in that particular case. Like you could say that in every paragraph. Unless it's a trusted environment, you should do it this way. I think if you're doing this draft, you're not in a trusted environment. And if you are in a trusted environment, you're not doing this draft, okay. or you don't need to. So I would, I would leave that out. Likewise, yeah. uh, you talk about minimizing logging to meet a client's wish, to honor a client's wishes. And it's like, I thought the point was you're not supposed to know what the client's wishes are. Yeah, that was a phrase that was suggested by your security AD. I, I saw I would, I would make that Maybe the whole, the whole section of management should be taken off, I suppose. I'm with you there. Uh, Lorenzo Cleary, I, I don't understand either the benefit or the goal. Um, so from quickly reading the draft, it seems like basically you're, what you're trying to do is you're trying to hide potentially personally identifying information from DHCP servers. Uh, but the people, who <coughs> the people who have access to the packets that are sent to the DHCP servers also have access to everything else that you send. So if there is stuff that's in the clear, so DHCP by itself is not like a major angle of attack. You can't figure out somebody's name or credit card number or you, you might be able to figure out what the previous private IPv4 network they were on or whatever, but it's not like a major, major avenue here. The, the, the more interesting avenue if you want to find out about somebody is like looking at their HTTP sessions and so on. So the question is, it, because the person who has access to the DHCP server also has access to all that other stuff, why would they look here? Right. If, if, if the, all the other stuff is encrypted, then there's nothing to gain by looking at this because there's nothing useful to correlate it to. No, there is location trust. If you assume, sure, if you assume that everybody on every network is, and, and but that's the, then this document basically is one document, like one, one recommendation, don't disclose your previous IP address, right? Because everything else dis, uh, divides. No, no, no. If, if you have an identifier, you, I can use the identifier for tracking your location. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there are two things, right? And uh, there's an IP address and a MAC address. But profiling, like figuring out, fingerprinting like the GHP implementation, this, this guy's running Windows 8.1. Okay, there's like, you know, <laughs> 300 million of them. So, uh, it's true that it can, f it can potentially maybe track people who are using very rare or exotic combinations, but. Okay, so basically what you are saying, there are two parts there. You, you, I assume you agree that publishing privacy information in a broadcast packet is not a terribly good idea. But that's what DHP does. It <laughs> but does, okay. actually. It doesn't no, that to. is what it does, okay. Yes, and what we say is that, hey, don't publish that because that gets you tracked. So if you're on a network that you, you just found a network that happened to broadcast, hey, free Wi-Fi to the corner of the airport, it's not necessarily a terribly good idea to broadcast your name and, uh, and your IP address and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess we're mm -hmm. you're making the second point is that in terms of profiling, that's not a huge threat and in the order of priority, profiling the user ident implementation is probably not the highest priority compared to not broadcast your name, not broadcast your unique ID. Yeah, I would mm -hmm. agree with that. Uh, so, Krishna, just to add one more thing for like Lorenzo. Uh, some of the recommendations would be just to not send any kind of identifying information. So don't put an FQDN in your DHCP messages to go on the clear, or like don't send the civic location in a DHCP packet. 
that any, everybody can see it, right? Or um, don't keep a DUID that's going to remain constant throughout the lifetime of your device in case you don't want uh, various actions to be linked together. I think that's where the recommendations would go. Can we also say don't use stateful DHPv6? Sure. If you want, <laughs> send a note like this is consensus. Yeah. No, no, the, the problem with don't use stateful HPV6 is that it's not necessarily under the client's control. Wait, what? If the router doesn't enable publishing of uh, uh, adver address prefixes for authentication, you're stuck. Okay, you use V4. Well, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, well, well, sure. I mean, say, okay, wh what you would say there is give up using IPv6 if the network doesn't let you do. Sell. No, so, so we, but, but look, that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is yeah. if, you know, we could discourage it as a protocol. Yeah, some operating systems I, I, don't I, implement I it. Been, right. I have been personally in the business of uh, making sure that you can connect automatically with IPv6 for a bit more than 20 years. So I'm with you on that. But, I mean, I, we have to cover all the best. Um, you know, there are some part, uh, part in the world that, yeah, um, in, in which we are continuing to offer some services, which we call fixed IP addresses. So we are offering a given service to, uh, to customers and they pay for that service to have this, what, the, a stable and permanent IP address. And if we come up with a profile that, you know, randomized, that, that, um, that will, uh, I am thinking about how, how, how this will Im impact, in fact, um, the management aspect of um, uh, the device that will be used that by, by customers so that because we don't know those that will request for that, for that, for that, for, for, for that feature. Is, is there any complication? Well, I, I, yeah, it, yeah, this kind of management and side effect of, in order to address the other requirements from some customers who pay to have the stable and permanent IP addresses. And the, so, well, how, how, how this is this, the, the, the main domain of application there are mobile devices. There's an that, MC that, 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 that go to various Wi-Fi yeah. hotspots. Clearly, you're not going to have a stable IPv4 address if you go to via, uh, various hotspots. No. If you stay at home and you have a machine that stays in your home and says, hey, I want to use that as my home mail server. I'm paying to have a stable IP address for that. Well, don't do this. Uh, but how the, how the mobile device or the, so the remote device? Can sorry? we cut it off because we are running late? And, you know, if you want to take this offline or take it on the mailing list, that's what I would recommend. Yeah, okay. I, that. I think, you know, this is focused on a different kind of device. You know, we're not advocating this for cable modems and CPEs to do and other fixed things, okay? And yeah. it should be a user configurable thing as well probably that, you know, should be thought about because, you know, there may be, even a mobile device might not always be mobile. Yeah. Right. That, 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 just to read, that means that I read to you, I make my first comment to have the use cases very called out so that we, we, we know what we are talking about. Yeah. Ted Levin, very briefly, just I mean, all we can do in this working group is DHCP privacy. And there's a lot of what you were talking about that's really outside of that scope. So, but, but I think, you know, use cases is good too. Right. And, and, and that, to that point, I think, you know, there was earlier discussion about the MAC address randomization. I don't think that's within our parlance, you know, so that, that's why I don't think we should, we should consider out of scope. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, the topic is the young data model for DRCPV. Oh, this is not mine. This is your CPV4, and my is your CPV6. This is the one, right? 
losing. I lost the D6 one. Okay, hold on a second. I'll have to get it back. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened to the D6 presentation. Well, we'll just use that for now. Yeah. Sorry. Oh. Yeah, I'll have to move this down. Right. <coughs> okay. Here. Tomex got it set up. And the preview is there. This is mine. And uh, uh, the topic is Young Data Model uh, for DLCPv6 configuration. And uh, the designed DLCPv6 Young Data Model can provide a unified method to configure DLCPv6 servers, really agents, and clients. And it is also better for ISP to configure and manage various DLCPv6 uh, entities. Uh, and uh, the whole modern structure has one notification and uh, three features, server, relay, client. Next. And uh, for the DCPv6 server submodel, uh, the main parameters contains uh, server attributes such as UID and address ports, prefix ports, and other parameters such as DNS server address and the relay opaque parameters, which is configured on the server side only for value match. And uh, the packet uh, status uh, presents the packet count statistics related to the DHCPv6 server. Next. And the, for the DHCPv6 relay submodel, uh, in addition to some basic attributes, uh, there, there are subscriber array, remote host array, vendor information, and the relay interface, interfaces array. For each relay, uh, we, uh, there is interface ID and the next entity array. The relay status uh, re record and presents the overall packet statistics of the relay agent. Uh, for the DHCPv6 client uh, submodel, uh, the main parameters is the client interface array. For each uh, client interface, there is the client RQDN, PD function, switch, uh, rapid, rapid commit switch, and dual stack switch, IMO tab, vendor information, and uh, identity association array and uh, 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 interface other parameters such as DNS server address. The packet status also record all the packet state, state status information of a specific interface. Next. And could for I, the- Could I ask a question in, in the uh, room here? Do you, do you mind? So, this is Kim Kinnear from Cisco. The client, the people, do you imagine configuring a client with NetConf? I mean, is that something, does anybody imagine configuring a client with NetConf? Am I the only person who would You think so? Okay. I just, I just, not my client. <laughs> and uh, for the DHCPv6 notification submodel, uh, there are s three parts. For the first part, DHCPv6 server events, there is address UDAP, prefix UDAP, and invalid client detected. 
For the second part, USAPV6 really went. There is a top change there. And the third part, USAPV6 client events, there is there are invalid I detected retransmission field and the field status turn off. Uh, yeah, uh, here you see it, uh, it's one model uh, for server and relay and client together, and yeah. each of them has sub-models. Um, I, I don't think that's the right way to go, because actually, you know, uh, they are not on the same devices. So instead, for one model and with sub-models, actually that's much better if you go with three models. Uh, one for server, one for relay, one for client. Otherwise, you, you know, the, the vendors have to, you know, for example, the vendor for client have to also implement the, you know, the relay part or the service part. That doesn't make sense. Uh, uh, I think the DSAPV6 protocol is, uh, uh, is just a protocol and uh, we use a feature to distinguish uh, server, client, and uh, uh, relay. And uh, if you want to, I just. And uh, that's all. Next. Next, and uh, we will update the tree diagram and the comments are welcome. Uh, Bing Liu, uh, do you consider the DHCPv6 uh, PD prefix delegation? Uh, because the normal client uh, relay yes, and server. I have, uh, I have PD in the, in the client, uh, there is a PD function switch. But uh, how about uh, a relay device uh, act as a, a PD requester? So I mean that maybe not necessarily uh, bind to the client role. Uh, you need a relay, maybe uh, maybe also need the PD. Yes. Repeat that, the relay may what about PD? I mean the re relay could also be the requester, the prefix requester. Oh, oh I see. But uh, so that a, a relay would be all, could also be a client is what you're saying? Uh, yes. As it could also be, you know, it could also be a, a server in some Yeah, cases. in, in prefix delegation context. Right. Uh. Yeah, but, uh, but, but even if those two functionalities are implemented on the same device, from the protocol perspective, these are two independent uh, entities. So this would be client and uh, relay. Okay, thank you. Hey, Kim Kinner, Cisco. In your server tree, I didn't see any way to connect prefix pools together into links. Uh, we have binding info, and which is uh, client uh, client DUID and the address, the binding info. Mission. The, the binding info is who has information about the prefix? Uh, Does binding, the binding info connects prefixes, prefix pools together into links? Yeah, Kim's yeah. asking about like the shared subnet model in V4, you know, where you have two. Three. I mean, sometimes you have multiple prefixes on one link in V6, and you hand right. out addresses from all of them. But there's no way to re there's no way to express this. I mean, this is a hard problem, frankly. Trying to configure DHP servers over the wire is something which we've tr tried at least twice, and not succeeded at in this working group over the past multiple years. So because I, everybody I, has different stuff. But I, I think one of the things that we probably want to do here, because of time, is not dive down into the details. It's more the meta question about do we think, you know, going to the last slide. What, what are, the, you know, there, there are some updates. If people have some comments about specific issues that are either missing or, or done incorrectly or something, they should send the stuff to the, the mailing list and stuff. And, and the I question is, do we want to move forward on this in I, some I, way? Before we uh, decide on moving forward or not, I just wanted to have a like, clarification question whether it, this work, Martin Shalovsky, I see, whether this work is based on 
any specific implementations of the DHCP server or or not? Like whether you, did you did you try to fit this model into existing configurations for the existing popular DHCP servers or not? Or this is something you may consider to do in the future? Uh, yeah, we will think it and uh, uh, if possible I will, I will. Uh, but, but do you haven't done that yet? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, Ian Farrer, um, looking through there and um, with one or two DHCP server implementations that I'm, I'm aware of, I don't see a direct uh, sort of mapping between the model and... Can, can you say which implementation? So I, I, I'm familiar with Nominum and ISC uh, to some extent. Um, I, I don't see any, um, you know, it's not, it's not a comprehensive knowledge, but it's, uh, you know, um, I don't see any relation to ones I'm familiar with. Um, have, or uh, the people involved with producing those servers, have they reviewed this model at this stage? Is there any comments from implementers? <laughs> You're like, like you, for example. <laughs> no, but, well, I'm, if the working group feels like, you know, we want to carry that forward, I will be more than happy to, to review that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it would really benefit from having, you know, some implementers as, uh, on the authors list and uh, contributing to this because, you know, these are the people who know how they're going to actually implement it into their product, and if it can't be implemented, it's not a lot of good. Right. And I, mean, I mean, I think the, you know, the idea would be that this probably is going to get the common denominator, but they're probably going to have to be special extensions to address individual implementations. Yeah, I, I mean, almost certainly uh, where, the, where the problem does get hard is when, you know, what is the common functional set that is, belongs to all, uh, all implementations or all of the considered implementations. Right. Now, it's you know, it's, a, it's the old SNMP problem, right? There's, you know, it's just different language. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, and I think what we're going to do is we're just going to have to, you know, if this is work that the group wants to take on, we're going to have to work with the, the uh, NetConf Yang folks, you know, to re help us out as well and stuff like that. And, yeah. you know, we're the domain experts, but they're, they may have some advice for us in certain I, I, areas. They certainly will do, but they, will, you know, but they won't tell you how to model what you need to do. They'll right. just tell you how to, do it, how to get it right stylistically. Um, a second comment is that it might be a good idea when naming options and things that are, you know, specifically defined with um, uh, and registered with IANA, it would be good to have commonality between things like option names because it, we, we've got a second set of naming that's uh, appearing in here. And it's just, you know, a layer of abstraction that doesn't bring anything. So h how many people would support, you know, this work moving forward? And, and, and I'm not asking whether, you know, we don't have to adopt it as, as a working group item now, but are interested in this work uh, moving forward? Anybody? Okay, good. All right, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is uh, DHCP v4 Yang model. Next, please. Uh, this has a similar design with the uh, previous DHCP v6 Yang model, which uh, covers all the three models. And uh, uh, when the one device is configured with different roles, the, uh, the configurations are generally separated. And, uh, they are not intrinsic relationship. And uh, we believe that uh, uh, it's proper to have two young models for DCP v4 and DCP v6, respectively, uh, because they basically are two protocols. Next, please. Okay, here are the main objects of the relay model. The basic one is uh, some general configuration. For example, the interface name and the server address. And besides this basic uh, configuration, we also provide a, a feature that uh, the servers could be grouped. Because in some situations, for example, for high reliability or load balancing scenarios, the, we might have uh, a few D 
GCP servers that they could be combined into different groups. So this is for this use case. And also some statics. Next, please. This is a server. And the common configuration is mostly about the pinning, that uh, the time period and the timeout setting for the address pinning. Then the maybe it's the most important object is the global IP ports. Uh, the address resource is configured in this uh, module. And uh, we also put some uh, very common used uh, options such as DNS and the net buyers and there is a IP port configuration because normally the DNS configuration is credited with a specific uh, IP port. And we also support uh, the, some user defined options. You can define private, op uh, private op options. Next please. Okay, here's a client, uh, mostly about the statics. Uh, okay, next please. Uh, I attended the Young Doctor advice session on Sunday and uh, received some uh, general comments. I think the first one is very important for us uh, to consider it. Uh, the Young Doctor, uh, Lada, uh, gave me a suggestion that if the, uh, just as shown comment uh, previously, maybe it's better to separate them into different models rather than in one model because most, most of the time the one device is only configured with one row. So um, I think this also applies to the DCP v6 uh, young model. And some uh, other minor comments, for example, uh, the add some client status in server module uh, because now we only include some uh, packet gran granularity statics. And uh, uh, this is an interesting but uh, a minor issue that, uh, for example, we name the global IP port like this, it might be confused for, for viewing. So it's better to use a more regular naming scheme with some dashes between the uh, characters. Okay, I think uh, yes. So I think it's we need review, especially from uh, server implementers, uh, whether we can come up with uh, some common configuration base. So I I'd, I'd like also to ask whether you think this is a useful work. Thank you. Okay, so Tomek Brugowski here. Uh, question, so did you work with the authors of the uh, V6, uh, Young's module, to make those two proposals as similar as possible? Uh, you mean before uh, the meeting, we have, whether we have some collaboration? Uh, yeah, well, so it would make sense to name the options uh, that overlap you know, in DHCP4 and DHCP 6 to have the same name, for example. So it would be good if you could uh, cooperate and okay, okay. try. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, sorry. Okay, thank you. And I, uh, is, you know, there, I, I assume the same sort of interest is in the V4 models as was in the V6 models, or does anybody have any comments on? on that. I mean, probably the V6 are more interesting since it's more likely to be used now than, but who knows. Ted Lemon. Um, I noticed that when you asked about the V6 model, you didn't ask if anybody didn't think it was a good idea. Um, I happened to raise my hand because I thought it was a good idea, but I'm curious. Uh, in, in this particular case, you know, I'm not quite as enthusiastic about this one just because it's DHCP V4, so. I'm not sure I'd raise my hand to say it's a bad idea, but but I'm not I'm not as supportive of it. Yeah. Okay. That that's sort of that was sort of my feeling as well that you know the V4 stuff is kind of legacy, but I don't know what where um, 
Where do you stand, Ian, on this? Because you were kind of interested in, in developing Yang models at one point. Um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, that, our interest is around making Home Gateway completely manageable over NetConf and Yang. And so, as it has a DHCP4 server in there, then yes, I do have an interest in there, but the functionality that's actually required for that is fairly minimal. So, yeah, a model, but it doesn't have to have that many bells and whistles. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, I think, you know, the authors are encouraged to continue working and collaborating on the, the effort. And then uh, maybe we'll we'll look at whether you know when to take it on as a work group item or, or whatever in the future. Sure. Uh, oh, he's, he's speaking. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, this is my only mistake to put him there as speaker. <laughs> uh, I, I know I will be speaker from the very beginning. <laughs> okay. Um, Thank you. Um, background. Yeah, we're already working on the security DHCP v6 for seven years. Uh, it's a long history. It come from the CTA based solution first. Then um, after we reach ISG, we has been pushed back by you know security ADC. The you know, they have problem with CJ. Uh, then that's another three years we're working on for the, you know, uh, public key based um, mechanisms. Um, it's finally, you know, uh, sent to IESG recently uh, to request the publication. Um, and we already has a, a round with uh, RAD, Ted, thanks for the very uh, useful, good comments, and uh, hopefully we will, you know, send that to ISG in after a minor update. Um, so uh, that's the background, and that's one of the reasons we didn't have the security DHCP before, before because you know, if we all fail for the D security DHCP v6, there's no point to <coughs> copy the wrong stuff around. Um, but now we, you know, have the you know, working on the security DHCP v4, uh, which is the uh, counterpart of uh, the security DHCP v6. Um, it's okay. Some uh, distinction there. Next page, please. Um, the major difference is the relay behavior, uh, because actually one, um, you know. Um, we design DHCP v6, the relay behavior has been changed significantly. Um, in DHCP v4, we actually uh, allow the relay agent to uh, modify the DHCP message by, you know, uh, several fields and also uh, add m new um, options at the end of the message become the new message. Um, Instead, in DHCP v6, we have the encapsulation module, which just embed all this uh, DHCP v6 message uh, as an option, then create a new uh, relay uh, forward and relay uh, reply message. Um, that makes very different for the security because, because you, for the security, you have to sign the whole message. Um, so, uh, fortunately, you know, in the security design, we uh, both get security HCP v4 and security HCP v6 don't, uh, don't try to protect, uh, pro sorry, uh, protect the contents added by the relay agent. So that means for those new contents added by the relay agent, we, we assume that's safe because that's, you know, in the relevant safe uh, environment, uh, we assume the between the relay uh, agent and the server, uh, it's, you know, um, like has a secure layer two link. Um, so at the end, we just need to 
leave the relay agent information option out of the signature. Um, so even if it come back from the, the server, when server creates the, uh, the new uh, reply message, uh, it take off the uh, relay agent information option you know, uh, and only sign the rest of the message. Uh, also, the, there are two fields in the DHCP message header uh, that will be modified when through the uh, relay agent. So we take that off as well. Um, don't sign that. Uh, actually, we uh, fill that two fields uh, by all zero uh, when made the signature. Um, one more thing is we because the DHCP v4 and the DHCP v6 have different uh, um, lens for the option code and option lens. Uh, so that's something we have to change uh, to fit DHCP v4. Um, but unfortunately, um, because the signature and uh, certificate may be very long to pass the you know, 8 bits lens. Uh, so we designed, you know, a mixed uh, special field, eight bits for option code and 16 bits for option lens. Uh, actually, Freddy, you want to comment on this? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I don't think, that, you know, we, we in V4, right, we don't want to have options that have 16-bit length fields. And Ted already wrote a, another RFC, which was, 3492 or something like that about encoding long options and that can just be used here the the you know the option length will just be 8 bits and if it if you need to encode more than 256 or you know 255 bytes you'll just have to put in multiple instances of the options and do the concatenating okay and then that will be in the next update with the associated endless security vulnerabilities. What? Could you come to the mic? Yeah, can we have this? If, if well, I guess we'll, we'll ignore those comments until we, we know what they are. Okay. So go and continue. Okay. Uh, <laughs> besides what we just said, we will um, make in the next update. There are some planned updates. Um, you know, uh, recently we have the latest modification on secure DHCP, and we still have some minor updates. Whatever uh, it may be, uh, we will apply that to the uh, corresponding part of the security HCP way four. Um, basically, that's uh, the last two items is the modification. And I'm not going to read it. Yeah. Next page. Okay, that's it. I think maybe we are we want to go or maybe up to you. Sir. I think as far as the adoption goes, what what I would recommend is we you know wait. So you do the update, and then maybe also it's worth looking at, you know, how the the SEDHCP v4 v6 draft mm -hmm. does through the rest of the process, right? Because yeah. if if that if that's a slam dunk and is done, right, then adapting it to work for the v4 environment should be pretty straightforward. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have slightly less time for this than we initially planned, so let's move through this quickly. So, as you all know, the uh, 5315B uh, was uh, adopted. Uh, so, I would like to briefly summarize what the adopted version is. So, it's uh, the original 5315 plus most of the text from 5633, uh, uh, so that's preface delegation. Uh, 5736, that's uh, stateless uh, DHCPv6, and RFC 7083, so that's uh, 
uh, inf, uh, max inf uh, RT and uh, max sol uh, uh, RT options. Uh, we managed to uh, close uh, uh, 108 tickets. They are addressed. That doesn't mean that every single one of them ended up in the, uh, uh, in the text. Some of them were re rejected. Uh, we are keeping track of the non-trivial changes. So there's an uh, appendix A. Uh, you can see what, uh, what the changes are. Uh, there are uh, ticket numbers there. Uh, if you want to look into the details, and sometimes there's an extended discussion, uh, there's the link to the, uh, to the BIS uh, uh, tracker. Uh, you, can, you can see uh, uh, what was the process leading to each change. So, uh, okay, so the adoption is done. There's one outstanding question. Uh, we have the ticket tracker, and every time there's a new ticket, or there is a comment, or we close the ticket, or move it to a different milestone, uh, there's an update uh, uh, sent to the mailing list. Right now it's uh, being sent to the DHCPv6 uh, list, so if you want to get those notifications, you can subscribe there. Uh, but the question is whether you should uh, stay this way, so that updates go to a separate list, or do you want them to, to be moved to DHC? No opinions? Nobody cares? I think since the num Suresh Krishnan, I think since the number is going to be much smaller, I think it's okay to use the main list from now on. I mean, it's not only about the numbers of tickets, but it is about the numbers of the updates that you do to the ticket, right? So you can use like a single ticket to flood the whole list with the email. So I would actually stick to the biz list for notifications. If you allow, this is Ted Lemon, if you allow anybody to anybody who's a DHC working group participant to subscribe to the biz list, then that solves both problems. You, people who don't want to hear the notifications don't have to, and people who do can. Yeah, right. Yes, of course. The list is open, so anyone can subscribe and uh, review the archives. And, and I think, you know, as a side comment, I think we, for anything that is, um, you know, we're, we're still trying to seek consensus or whatever, we probably will try to have or we should try to have a separate discussion on the DHC working group mailing list about that and it, then it would eventually, you know, some of that discussion or the final conclusion of the discussion would end up in the ticket. Uh, so this question again. So like since like st things have changed, right, so this is no longer like an individual document, it's a working group document. Correct. So theoretically everything going in needs to be discussed on the DHC list anyway. But, okay, what else do you anticipate to be in the status of this? Yeah, I mean, uh, yes, we, we made the uh, working group document, so that means everything should be discussed and, uh, in the working group. Uh, but that's only in the, you know, uh, the decision should be made in the, uh, you know, working group mailing list. But uh, the, the tracker itself, the, the notification, there, there's no much. You know, other people may get bored. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the tracker is not a person and therefore not a participant. <laughs> yeah, right. And, well, there's also a thing that if I change, like, the owner of the ticket um, from Ted to Marching, then it means that everybody gets to know that. And I'm not sure if this is any useful information for anyone. So. I, I think it will require a little bit of more work on the people that are sort of dealing with the tickets in that any time we you know, what, what, if, if we feel we have a consensus and we put it in the ticket, that's a ticket or th an email that should go to the rest of the working group to make sure that people agree, right? That, that's, so it's going to require a little bit more management on our part now that it's a working group document to make sure that we have consensus before we, we apply changes. Yeah, um, uh, exactly. I mean, the co-authors for this draft should be more carefully uh, than before. Uh, whatever the you know, official design or, or official update should you know, get the approval from the working group before apply those changes. Yeah. 
Right. Like so the whole idea of the ticketing system, sending these mails is to, so that some human doesn't have to do this, right? So let's say like somebody triages this and say, okay, this is what we need to look at and adds a comment, the tracker sends it and it's like easy for some human to, okay, as long as like DSCP v6 is open to everybody, which I didn't know, like, but like that, that's okay. But I think the point of the mails is actually to show this progress to the list. So I, I don't mind either way, but I, for me it made more sense to send it to the main list. I'm cool with that, but um, personally, Ted Lemon, I would like us to talk about the actual stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, so we're going to move on. on. <clears throat> okay, so how the work is organized. Uh, we have uh, monthly calls. Uh, it's uh, always on the first uh, Wednesday of the month. Uh, the next upcoming meeting is on April the 1st, and it's, it's going to be a serious meeting. <laughs> Uh, so these are the times. Uh, if you want to participate, uh, this is the link to Jitsi. Just make sure that uh, you have microphone and you can participate. Uh, anyone who is interested to join in this effort uh, are welcome to do so. Uh, the agenda will be sent a uh, couple days uh, to the DHC list in advance. So there's actually a process for that that you have to follow. These, these would qualify as interim meetings. Uh, I'm not sure if we need to qualify. This is how the... If you're working on something that's a working group work item, it's an interim meeting. Okay. Right? Uh, otherwise, even otherwise... Even if it's virtual one? Huh? Yeah, yeah virtual meeting, right, yeah. Other, otherwise, where's the consensus process? Uh, See what I mean? Okay. So, yeah. so, so you should you we just request uh, interim meetings in the... So yeah, you're requesting a virtual interim meeting and you need to give two weeks notice of the meeting and you need to give a week's notice of the agenda. It's pretty straightforward. Not a big deal. I just wanted to make sure that you did that so that we, so that we didn't get dinged for it later. Okay. You <laughs> mentioned uh, two weeks in advance? Two weeks, yeah. Okay, so that's... But get started now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll help you out with that. I mean, not that I'm an AD anymore, but I, mm -hmm. I know who to talk to. <laughs> Okay. Well, he's not sitting right there. Um, yeah, I, we had very bad experience for this tool, uh, uh, So, Well, uh, I recall that the last time we tried, it was, it's almost worked. Just one of the participants didn't have a microphone. W uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes. That's uh, I know that's, me, that's my problem. That, that time I have to go uh, bridge by uh, body, but that, that may happen. You, you know, you, you may have a separate... Uh, uh, okay, so if the so, uh, uh, doesn't work out, we'll have a backup with WebEx. Yeah, at least we should have backup mechanism mm -hmm. there. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Bernie? Uh, okay, so the stateful issues, Bernie, do you want to cover those or...? Well, um, just briefly, you know, the, the document uh, was... Uh, put in the RFC editor queue the other day, so it is uh, effectively done, and that unblocks quite a few of the tickets, um, and we will start our work to apply um, most of those changes to the updated, you know, to the biz document. It's, it, those, the next thing that um, Tom Apple will talk about will probably, you know, it makes it a little bit more difficult because we also want to reorganize some of the material. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thanks a lot to Ole, uh, Bernie, and Martin for doing this work. Okay, so the next uh, topic that I'd like to bring to the group attention is uh, ticket uh, 142. So this is the current uh, layout of the existing text. Uh, so when you take a look at this, the parts that the client must do and the server must do, they are intervened. So, and it would be much more readable for, for the implementers if they were grouped together. And by the way, this is something that Option Guidelines uh, recommends. So we will just restructure the text. Uh, so uh, this will be mostly moving the text around. Th there won't be any meritoric change. Okay, next. Uh, we need to clarify uh, how to handle unknown options. So this is the text from RFC uh, 3315 section 16 and uh, some implementers got confused with uh, that uh, not allowed is uh, uh, was implemented uh, uh, unknown was uh, uh, interpreted as not allowed so there are some implementations that 
uh, drop packets if they receive any options that are not recognized by the implementation. This is ob obviously wrong, so, so we will uh, clarify that it, it's just the option that should be ignored, not the whole packet. And this also, uh, there are two cases that uh, we want to clarify. The first is for the regular options, and another one is when there's uh, the vendor options with uh, unknown enterprise ID. Okay, next, please. Okay, so ticket uh, 81, there's a question. Uh, should the protocol, uh, protocol options be included in ORO? Uh, like, for example, IANA, IADR, IAPD, and I prefix. So there are some implementations that uh, request those options. It's pretty obvious that this is not the case, but uh, we, should, we will add a clarification text for this. Uh, so there's a related question. So uh, do we want to explicitly define a list of protocol options that would, uh, then we could refer to them as uh, uh, using a single term rather than listing them explicitly. So do you think it's a good idea or not? If you're, yeah, <laughs> Ted Lemon, if you're gonna do that, you should just add a column to the IANA registry because otherwise you're gonna have to reissue drafts every time you add an option to that list. Okay, we can do that, that's but cool. I don't know, I don't know if it's the right thing to do, but <laughs> but you could do that. Okay, I mean, and uh, is everyone okay with referring to them as protocol options or do you, want, do you have any better term for this? Uh, I think you need to be really careful, this is Ted Lemon again, <laughs> I think you need to be really careful not to um, create uh, implicitly sent options. Um, and so the reason why I, why I was a little ambivalent about actually adding the, the column to the registry is because I actually think that all of the options should be listed in the RO. Every option that you're expecting to get should be listed in the RO because um, otherwise you get into exactly the situation where it's a little bit of a judgment call whether it's implied that, that an option should be sent to you and therefore you don't need to put it in the RO and then you wind up with interoperability problems. Whereas if you just say it's got to be in the RO, if it's not in the RO, you're not going to get it, then um, you don't have that issue. Well, so my personal uh, interpretation is that if there is a text somewhere in the RFC, the server sends option X, then it doesn't have to be. So that's an implicit option. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the problem with that is that then, you know, obviously if it's something like IANA, of course the server is going to send an IANA. Right, I mean, yeah, but uh, you know, you can easily imagine some option that is defined in an option draft and the text was just a little bit vague about this and um, you know, the, the, the option is, it's sort of implied by something that you sent that maybe the, the option should be coming back but you didn't put it in the RO and some implementations might send it and some implementations might not and Furthermore, you have to have extra code in the server to figure out whether or not to send that option. Um, and that just seems like, you know, I mean, I, this is an implementation thing. I mean, I'm sure you ran into it in Dibbler and I ran into it in, in, in the ISC server and, and we've got it in our Nominum server too, that you just have this list of things that you have to maintain that, uh, you know, won't be asked for, but you have to send them anyway. Mm -hmm. And that just seems, you know, messy. Well, it seems a lot of work, though, to have somebody add something and then have, you know, the client add a list of options and then the server have to sort of ignore those list of options, right? So that, you know, if we always added them to the ORO, right, you're bloating the packet right. coming out because now the client's got to add them all and the server's got to sort of say, hey, I know I don't need to add, you know, I should take these out of the list of OROs, right? Or have some other logic that, that kind of prevents well, them from what being you sent. should do is not send the option if it's not in the ORO. <laughs> but, you know. Well, and I, I think we've, we've, you know. I, I, guess, I, mean, I, I think, guess maybe it has, but, but. Yeah. Would they not work? Well, I, I can't remember how that argument came out, but 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 that was certainly an argument we had when we wrote 3315 yep. in the first it, place. Okay, but, uh, but anyway, yeah. So, Ted, but but this, this is a question: if the client does not request, for example, to send back server ID, 
and which is obviously mandatory. So should the server now break the conformance because the client is broken? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I get that that train has left the station, but the thing that I'm concerned about is that I don't want us to start creating situations. Where, so like a, a, a DHCP v4 implementation, there are a bunch of options that if you send a certain option, um, you're ex you're, it's expected that another option will come back even if you didn't list it in the parameter request list. And I don't want us to get into that state with, the, with RFC 30, with, with DHCP v6. So we could say that there's some set of options that must be sent always, but I think if an option is ever op optional um, in any meaningful way, then, uh, then having it be implied that the option comes back if you send some other option or if there's some other combination of factors or something like that is a bad thing. And we should just require that if you're expecting an option to come back, it appear in the ORO. Right. And I, I think actually your suggestion of the IANA registry might make that yeah, more I mean, clean. If you do that, that's the way to do it. Right. Because then, then you know, it's supposed to have expert review or, or you know, we're, and that's another issue that, you know, we're, we're updating yep. the requirements for, for that for the IANA registry. But that would probably be a clean way to do it because hopefully it wouldn't go in there incorrectly. Yep. Right. So, yeah, it's confusing. I think what you're... If you end up with a protocol option session there, then those always get sent, right? And anything else has to be in the URL. Does that work? For you? That's kind of what I think you're just both saying. I just want yeah. to make sure, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, there's a little bit of ambiguity because, for example, if you don't get an IANA on the way out, you're not going to send an IANA back. Right. So, and and so there, that's still sort of optional in the sense that it won't always be sent. Do you see right. what I mean? Yes, Whereas I the server it. identifier option would and, always and, be sent. Yes. And the yes. corollary is if the, the client asked for an IANA but doesn't send an IANA, it's never going to get an IANA back, right? Anyway. So, right. Yeah. so, I mean, that's why those are sort of what we deem as protocol options because, you know, you, for, for the protocol to work, you've got to send that option back if the client sent it. So, you know, but we agree that this is one of those things that, you know, we all know what we mean, but it, writing it is not very easy. Okay, next. Okay, so the next question is whether ORO is now effectively mandatory. Uh, so the RFC 7083 uh, says that the client must include Solmax LT option code in ORO, uh, uh, and the same is true for INF uh, Max LT. Uh, So the original uh, intention was that uh, the client must include those options if it sends uh, ORO. So the question is whether all ORO should be sent. Uh, uh, in every case, or just whether the, the client asks uh, for any options. Ted Lemon again. I think it would be really unfortunate if we um, added a requirement to the DHCP base protocol spec on the basis of a wording uh, omission in in a small okay. document. So I, I think that I think the right thing to do is actually just update that document from RSC 3315. Um, you just add a little okay. footnote that says that was a mistake. <laughs> okay, that would work. Yeah. So and uh, also, I'm, I'm not. I, I don't follow exactly what you're suggesting. Yeah, yeah. There, okay. That's totally bogus that a new option draft should create a protocol requirement. Right. Okay. Right. The the and and I think I'd have to go back and see, but I think the you know the the 7083 language is really that you should. I, I'm not sure whether it's a should or a must. You know, I have to go back and look at that about sending these in the first place. But they they aren't. It isn't. You know, there's other text elsewhere that kind of says you should do this. And and again, it may be a should or must. But this didn't really say that. So it, 7083 says you must include that option if right. you're a 7083 box. But <laughs> we've seen servers that if they don't get OROs, they blow up from like think CPEs. So I, you know, I think we might want to say something about this either way. Well, Did it's they blow up like they crash? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, we, we tried this. We sent some, they were assuming that there'd be DNS options. Someone would ask for them. And when they didn't, the server just didn't give them anything. 
So I, <laughs> we might want to say something about this somewhere. Um, I'm not obviously talking about the enterprise DHCP servers. I'm talking the little boxes. Okay, and uh, another follow-up question regarding uh, 7083. Uh, it's unclear whether the client, uh, when it sends solicit, should it uh, ask for both sol max rt and inf max rt or just the uh, sol max rt. So our in interpretation is that it can, uh, so, so should it uh, always ask for the, for both options and the answer is no, but the client may. If if it's interested in getting bought. I don't think that you should add a may because it's silly to ask for infmax RT if you're sending a solicit, right? Well, so it, it is and it isn't. You know, there is the possibility that the client, right, at an application comes along, asks for something, and generates an information request. Now, right, at which point you would request an infmax RT option. Yeah, but, you know, and, and but if the, if, there is nobody answering that, right, then you might be transmitting at a high rate. Whereas if you had asked for it with a solicit and the server said, oh, you should be using, you know, 10 hours for this thing, right, you now had it. Okay, you win. Yep, that's right. It should be, it, 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 I, think that, I think that based on what you just said, it must in the, in the solicit ask for both. I mean, it's not clear to me. Well, actually, yeah, it makes sense in both of the, both cases. If you're sending an information request, you should ask, both because right. well if if yeah. a client's stateless only right mm -hmm. then obviously it doesn't need to ask anything about yeah soul yep. right and yep. vice versa yep. but yep makes sense okay okay so Bernie these are the tickets that you prepared so yeah mm -hmm. so there was a you know this this was from an old uh, DHCP v6 bake off in March 2007 that really never got address, and I'm not sure we need to address it here because I think nowadays people understand what is supposed to happen, but, you know, if there's no router advertisement information about a specific prefix and the DHCP server assigns an address, and there's, no, again, no router thing that covers that address, some stacks were installing that as a slash 64, okay, at, this was at that time. The recommended action is, is if you don't ha if you don't have prefix information, which DHCP does not provide you, when you get an address assigned to you, you should use slash 128. Okay. Now, is that something you know technically we need to document? That's the question. Tim Winters, Iowa, please document this. I, a lot of people screw this up. Okay. Ted Lemon, we should just make sure that it's in sync with the with the IPv6 specs that we're not actually changing something, you know, like on link. Yeah, it's kind of funny because RC 5942 section 5 says slash 64 is wrong, but it doesn't go back. It doesn't go and say use slash 128. Right. You know, there it, it, it is kind of twisty language in that elsewhere it kind of mentioned slash 128 is what should be used. What is the prefix length of an address? Well, that, that's right. It's a 128. What is the prefix length of an address? I, I assert that the term is meaningless. What we use it to mean is that the address implicitly con configure, uh, implicitly also specifies a directly connected root of the length that we use as the prefix length. That's what it means. If I say blah, 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 slash 64, I mean that that address has the address that I gave it, and it also implicitly creates a root of 64 by masking out the end. Right. So um, I would argue that the confusion here comes from the fact that addresses don't have prefix lengths, <laughs> right? So um, 64 is incorrect because there is no prefix length, right? And so I, I do think we should document this. Uh, and I, I think we should try to avoid the term prefix length of the address because there kind of is none. Okay, yeah. Pre so yeah. And in v for, like, for what it's worth, the GP4, we don't, well, I mean, GP4 doesn't have the prefix length as a net mask, but that is a well defined concept. Right. Yep. I'm Jim Metat here. Um, you may also refer to uh, um, RFC 7421, uh, which is known uh, something like Y64. 
and uh, I propose a text about this exact issue. Which, which was the RFC number 7421, again? I think. Kind of, why, why are you using six, um, project saying 64 or something? Okay, <laughs> just for your information. All right. Okay. Um, so an, another thing that's come up is that there are uh, clients that send IA adder options with zero, um, you know, with zero address, and they send non-zero lifetimes, which, you know, is according to the text deemed to be a, a, a valid way to request lifetimes of a specific value. But there are other clients that send an IA adder with zero addresses and no lifetimes, i.e. zero lifetimes, to request addresses. And we recommend that clients don't do this uh, to not include a IA adder unless they are specifically asking for, you know, or specifically providing hints. And the same thing goes with the IA prefix with no hints that you do not include either an IA address option or an IA prefix option that basically has all zeros for the address and the lifetimes and the, the prefix length. There, uh, just how Virginie, there is a hint actually provided if nothing is there. Means that maybe it has to be deprecated and the client would like to have another address or prefix. Yeah, but th that's yeah. not the way if, so if a client were to send an IANA with three IA adders in it that was all zeros, right? That, you know, you might think, oh, is that a request to the server to give it three addresses? But that's not the way that HTTP was, V6 was designed to work. If a client wants three addresses, you know, it should include three IANAs. No, oh, what I was wondering, well, okay, if, if, if a client, somebody asked on the OMNET um, list recently if there was a way in the HTTP V6 to actually, for the client, to deprecate and ask for another address or prefix. Okay, that's a different thing. So, if but you I, I guess here the ADDR would be, would not be zero, it would be the existing one. Is, is that right. a and legal it, and thing? It, well, if you want to deprecate an address or you want to get rid of it, you release the address, okay? No, no, let me explain. Okay. Ted so actually the question was, you, you don't want to get rid of the address, you just want to get a new address and gracefully renumber to that new address. So what you actually want to do is just generate a new IAID and send two IANAs. Right. And then, the, the, or actually you don't even need to send the other IANA because you're not renewing the address. So, so you just keep it for its valid lifetime and then it dies. Correct. So, so there's no need for this extra stuff. Right. Yes. By the way, this is something that we may want to document at some point. Just, you know, I'm sort of yeah, operationally make that work. Yeah, because that, I mean, this, I think this stuff, the way that these zeros, you know, these colon colon address requests have been used has been misinterpreted by people. Yeah, but, but, but even beyond that, I mean, it's a use case that wasn't really anticipated when we, when we did 3315, but it's, it's a use case that people consider to be worthwhile now. Uh, I think that if you talk to Christian or you talk to Ian, they'll tell you that. And so um, it might be worth just adding some text here that says, that talks about this use case and how to make it work and right. why you might want to. Since we're do, since we're since we got the document open, <laughs> right? Okay, I'm just gonna write that down. Good. All right. Um, another issue that and this one is a tough one, and I'm not you know I may not articulate it well, but you know the the most hints are are just that like addresses. You know if a client supplies addresses or supplies a prefix that it wants or provides lifetimes, those are pretty easy to deal with. The, the harder thing is uh, prefix length and exactly, you know, if a client asks for a prefix length, um, and this is mostly in, in like a solicit, exactly what it means. And part of this gets into server policy, but it also gets into, you know, people may not even, may not think it through. And so the question really comes down to, you know, how much of this might we want to, I'm not, I'm not I don't want to enforce policy on servers. You know, servers are free to ignore this stuff or whatever. But if you do want to use it, how should you use it to make it work sort of what might be an expectation by the client? You know, there, the, the two obvious cases are where a server already has allocated a delegated a prefix and, um, you know, of a particular length. And either the server's configuration, so, so let me back up. So the client, has asked for a 
you know, whether it's asked for a specific prefix length or not doesn't matter. The server's allocated a prefix of some length to the client. Now the client configuration changes, so it may ask for a different prefix length or a prefix length that the client did not get, okay? And the question is, what should the server do in that case on a solicit? It's also possible the server's configuration changed. Previously, it was not able to grant the slash 60 that the client asked for, but, you know, the lease still exists, and it now comes in. It got a slash 64 previously. Now it asks the client, re asked for a slash 60. What's, what's the preferred solution? Do you give it the 64 that it had, or do you give it the slash 60 that it's requesting in the hint field? And again, I don't, I, I think this is a gray area because it's a policy issue for the server, but I think it's also, you know, what's the client experience? So I think that this is actually um, a, a clarification, or it, it's, a, it's a protocol enhancement in, in the guise of a clarification. Um, I don't think that the protocol currently allows you to change the size of your prefix by sending a hint. And uh, Well, that, again, it's, this is more on a solicit, right? We're talking about oh, a solicit. So, so on a solicit, you would hint both the prefix and the... No, on the, on the solicit, you would probably just say I, I'm, you're just including an IA prefix option with a hint. Not you're not saying I have a slash. Okay. You know, it, you're not renewing. You're not advertising oh. or requesting what you had before. You're just saying I want a slash 60. I guess I didn't understand what the. Yeah, I, I have to is. articulate. I, I should. I think this is one I should take offline and send an email to clarify a bit more what the what the situations are. Um, just from Le Virginie, speaking as a former cable operator, I don't want the protocol to specify what I'm supposed to do in my policies. No, and, and that's, so. I, I think this is, I want to be careful about this because I, I think it's perfectly uh, fine for servers to have policy that, you know, completely overrides this. But it's just something that I think servers that do want to implement honoring the client's hint should consider in how they, you know, apply the hint, right? So it's more of a question about if you wanted to, if your policy was to apply the hint, these are things that you need to think about when you're doing the implementation. Okay, so you're going to say, if you implement this in the server, you should have a flag that controls that behavior, basically. Is that what you're going to say? I'm not saying that a server has to do that. No, I, I want to stay away from that. I'm just saying if you want to, to, to do, you know, if you do want to honor the client's hints, here are things that you should consider. Again, I think I need to, I, I, I will, I'll send out an email to the mailing list at some point to try to explain the problem a little bit better and maybe even suggest some text. Where's for me? Um, you want to cover this? So, Marcin. Yep. Yeah, I happen to prepare the slides, so. Um, yeah, so currently, currently section 11 says that the, the server must not assign uh, an address that's otherwise reserved for some other purpose, right? And the question here is if that should be sort of more specific, like what reserved addresses the server should not assign, if any, and uh, or not, or, or this is fine, right? And the second question then is, since there is no client behavior included in, in, in a case where it gets the, the addresses sort of invalid, and it, you know, it cannot assign that to the interface because it is a multicast address or whatever, what the client should do. Uh, so the, the question will be whether the client behavior should be specified here as well. So one, well, Tesla going to the mic, Bernie. If, if you got something, don't let me interrupt you. What? If you're going to say something, don't let me interrupt you. Okay, I, I was just going to say that Suresh and I at one point were thinking about documenting the list of sort of reserved addresses, but when we actually looked into it, there wasn't that much to document. Yeah. So uh, I'll tell you what I was going to say, which ties in with what you were going to say. Essentially, section 11 is instructions to the administrator of the server. 
And there is no way that a client could possibly validate that because the administrator has that information and the client doesn't. So no, you shouldn't add any text for client behavior here. Okay. And I don't think you need to make it any more specific because the fact of the matter is if they allocate an AnyCast address that is going to cause a problem, guess what? <laughs> they'll have an operational problem, they'll notice it and they'll fix it. So I think we're good. Yeah, personally I agree with you, but you know, it was a problem. Yeah, no, it's a good question. Yeah. Well, but there are cases when the server could be obviously misconfigured and start assigning, let's say, multicast addresses. So this is something that the client could validate and reject such servers. Yeah, so this is the last thing. Uh, <laughs> so the, the, uh, the 3315 specified the delayed authentication protocol and it, it's the description of authentication protocol sort of under specifies the, uh, the case of the information requests, right? It talks about the solicit and well, at, at some point it also mentions about the information requests, but it's just like very little section. And, and the question is whether the information request should be processed by the server in sort of the same way as the solicit is, or you know the solicit advertise um, uh, exchange is required before you actually do information request, but it doesn't make sense if you just want to have a stateless uh, exchange, right? So, um, yeah. So, Ted, you're going to know from this that I've read all of the slides. <laughs> um, the, uh, my opinion about this, which I think we can't really discuss here since we're already over time, is that um, we should just take delayed authentication out of the protocol spec because nobody's using it. Okay. And, and that, so that, that eliminates this whole question. Hmm? Right, but, if we, but, but the thing is that if we, if we dis decide to keep it mm -hmm. for some reason because someone objects to that, sure. I think it should be Clarify, right? Yeah, no, we, no if, 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 if we need to keep it, then you're right. The text as written is actually pretty ambiguous and we need to figure out how to right. fix so it. So do you have any preference with respect to any of those? Like uh, I didn't find any of those exactly what I wanted. I, okay. I think that but we actually need to add text that's specific to how information request is done because it's, diff it's, it's going to be different. Um, and and I, yeah, I, I, yeah okay. I, I thought about this for a while and basically basically my my main reaction was, why are we even doing this? But, but I think if we do do it, we need to, okay, we need to architect. So the it. conclusion is that we're taking it to the to the mailing list for yeah. the further This is a great. Well, question. I think we have to confirm that you know, and and I guess the proposal would be that we should probably take out the delayed authentication protocol, but we should keep in the the reconfiguration key authentication protocol. We will leave in, but we'll just take out the delayed authentication protocol. Yes. So that, that would be the proposal. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, folks. That's it. We're done. See you in Prague. <laughs> or on the mailing list. Too well in there.